Hello, hey, thank you for having me here today. I'm very excited um, to have the opportunity to talk to you about history and historical preservation, but from maybe a little bit different perspective. Um, what I do is I don't really deal with buildings or places or spaces or objects. Um, I'm a filmmaker. I make documentary films. And it's a very peculiar profession. Um, I approach things in terms of story. So I think it's very different uh, from what you do. Um, I'm Mexican-American. Um, I'm, for most of my life, I've been pretty much the only Chicano filmmaker that I ever met. It's been very lonely. <laughs> And um, uh, I grew up in Seattle, Washington. Okay, I come from a family of migrant farm workers. Okay, so the idea of becoming a filmmaker was something completely uh, absurd. It was something that you really didn't think about. It just wasn't within the realm of human possibility. Um, and so I grew up, and I was the my family had fled Eastern Washington because they were migrant farm workers, and they wanted to escape the migrant farm working life which is horrendous, in case you don't know, OK? And so they, they fled, and they fled uh, the Yakima Valley, and they went to Seattle, um, and that's where I grew up. And I grew up in a community that was all white, and I was the only Mexican kid. And this is very difficult for me, and it's kind of embarrassing to say, and I really don't talk about this publicly, uh, but I feel like it's kind of necessary. Um, I had a nickname when I was a kid. Uh, my nickname was Spick. Now, I, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the term. A lot of people aren't. Um, but it's, I don't know it's, a, you know, it's a racial epithet. It's like chink or kike or gook or nigger. It's one of those words. And that's. It wasn't, I mean, that's what people called me. And the really embarrassing part is, is that I had no idea what that word meant. Because my parents never used those words. And so I just thought that they were like using this funny nickname. And I thought, oh, well, that's funny. You know, that's cool, I guess. And I just had no idea. And so growing up throughout my entire educational process, uh, through elementary school and middle school and high school. I never learned about any Mexican-American in American history. Not one. And so I grew up thinking, and so did my white counterparts, we grew up thinking that it was other people who had built America. It was other people who had forged democracy. It was other people who had moved westward and tamed the wilderness. It was other people who had uh, uh, marched for civil rights and died for that cause. It was other people who had built the great industries of America, who had fought our wars. It was other people who were the inventors, who were the tinkerers who really created the American story. But it wasn't Mexican-Americans. We were the losers of history. While other people were, making the, were fighting the good fight to bring freedom and democracy not only to North America but to the world, we were kind of hanging out on the sidelines with our hands in our pockets, watching history roll on by, and then, once a great nation was built, we were kind of jumping in to snatch the goods. We were taking the jobs. We were taking the benefits. We were kind of stealing. We weren't legitimate because we hadn't fought that fight. So if some of us were citizens like me, we were really citizens in name only. We really didn't earn our Americanness. 
We were outsiders, we were foreigners. In other words, I kind of, as I found out what that word meant, spick, on some level, all the evidence seemed to indicate that, yeah, that's true, I am a speck. That's what the history, the story of America told me. And so we were kind of in agreement in a way. So I finished high school and, and I went to college and, uh, and I dropped out after about a year. I became a Latino dropout statistic. I pumped up the numbers that year. And, um, and, 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 and a friend of mine had this crazy idea. We were hanging out and he said, you know what? Um, I was into photography. That was like my thing. I, I love taking photographs. And, um, and my friend said, hey, you know what? He had heard about a school in India. And he said, hey, why don't you write to them and see if, uh, 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 see if, they, if you could teach there. You could teach them photography. It was like a stupid idea. It was like ridiculous. And so, but I thought, uh, okay, whatever. You know, so I wrote a letter. I got the address. I put it in the mail. You know, and I forgot about it. I went back to my job at the sandwich shop. And, um, and then I, a couple of months later, I got a letter back that said, yeah, come on. <laughs> and I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> right? I mean, I'd never been away from home. I didn't know any India. What do I know about India? I saw the movie Gandhi. <laughs> you know? So anyway, so I, I, you know, so, 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 so I decided to go. And back then, what you could do is you could take a one-way trip. You could get a ticket. And as long as you went one direction around the globe, you could make as many trips as you want going one way. And so I started to go. And I went. And I went to Paris for the first time. And I went to Greece. And I spent a month in Israel. And I landed in India. And so I got the students who could speak English, because most of them spoke Hindi. And I taught them photography. We built a dark room. I showed them how to process film, how to print pictures. It was cool. And then one evening, they came to me and they said, hey, the villagers in Susera, the next village over, have never met an American. And they would like to meet you. And I thought, OK, well, let's, let's go. So we walked through the jungle. It was evening about two kilometers to get to Susera. And we got there, and the villagers had built a huge bonfire. And around the bonfire, they had pulled their beds from out of their huts. And they were around this bonfire, and they motioned us to sit on their beds. And I felt very uncomfortable. I didn't know what to do. But we sat on the beds. And then they started telling these stories. And they were speaking in Hindi, so my students were translating for me. And they were stories about the gods and the goddesses. Hanuman and Ganesh and Shiva and Vishnu and Lakshmi and Krishna and Ram. And I thought, what the hell is going on? What are they talking about? You know? And, but I just I kept listening. And, I, and as the evening wore on, I began to see that what they were doing is they were telling these stories. And the stories were like little parables. Parables about what it is to lead a life well lived and what it is to lead a life squandered. And they consecrated what was worthy of remembrance and what was not and what should be forgotten and returned to dust and be gone with the wind. And so that evening, we went on until about 3 o'clock in the morning, and that evening we were walking back through the jungle Maybe, yeah, like I said, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. I don't know. And we're walking back, and I began to think about the United States. I began to think about America. And I thought, what happened to our ability to gather around the sacred fire to tell the stories? We're so divided. And it seems like we always had been. And I thought, how do we capture that, that beautiful sense that I saw in India? And then it struck me. It seems so clear. We do gather around the sacred fire. We gather around a burning box. And that burning box is television. And we gather around a burning wall. And that burning wall is cinema. And I guess now we gather you know, around these, right? And it is through these fires 
that we tell the sacred story of our people. It's through these fires that we try to figure out what it is to lead a life well lived and what it is to lead a life squandered. It's through these fires that we figure out what is worthy of remembrance and what shall be forgotten and turned to dust. And so I became, long story short, I ended up becoming a documentary filmmaker and I had this idea that it was, that what I should do is tell the story of my people. Now, I didn't know what the hell that meant. I mean, I, you know, and I'm still figuring that out. I don't know what that means exactly, but that's what occurred to me, and it kind of set me off on a life journey. And um, interestingly enough, as it turns out, and this is just purely by accident, um, I'd been shooting something, a work in progress, um, here in Texas, part of it, and part of it, was actually shot not far from where we sit today, in a little town just south of here called Goliad. And I thought, you know what, since we're in Texas and you probably come from all parts of the country, maybe I could share with you just a little clip and show you what I'm working on, because I think it actually has something to do with why we are gathered here today. Um, so let's go ahead, can you guys dim the lights and can we, can, we, can we show the clip real quick? Well anyway, this is, this is what I wanted to show you because it, it is considered by many to be the most famous tree in all of Texas. Okay. This is the famous hanging tree of uh, Goliad County. It was a site of execu extrajudicial executions. In other words, this is where they lynched Mexicans. How many Mexicans were there? Some say 80, 90, 100, but we really don't even know. And of course, on the other side of there is a famous whipping post where they would tie Mexicans and, and other people, blacks, and, and, and whip them for uh, transgressions against the, the, uh, the social order. Uh, over there, uh, we have a tree where it is said that they hung the blacks because, um, I don't know, it's kind of crazy. Even, you know, in Texas, we had standards. You can't lynch a, a black person from the same tree that you lynch a brown person. And, you know, it just ain't fitting. It ain't fitting. It just ain't fitting. So, right. so yeah, so they, I mean, uh, this, this is the kind of crazy racism that fueled all this. And why? It was economics. And it was also the fact that they wanted our land. They, in fact, they came here to take our land. And they were very successful. It's a tourist thing now here. Everything's named Hanging Tree around here. But, um, I mean, when you really think about it, it, it should give you the creeps. This is, uh, I mean, this is horrible. You know? Yeah, it is horrible. It is what it is. It is what it is. The events that took place here in Goliad weren't unique. Over the next 70 years, there were 871 documented lynchings of Mexican Americans in 13 Western states. And yet the violence found in the rest of the Southwest didn't compare to the horror of South Texas. In a single decade, from 1910 to 1920, historians estimate as many as 5,000 Mexican Americans were murdered in a brutal wave of terror and mass executions. In proportion to their numbers, Mexicans were lynched in the West as often as blacks were lynched in the South. All right, is everybody totally depressed now? I mean, I didn't mean to bring you down, okay? I, this happened a long time ago, okay, right, okay? But, um, uh, but it's important. But it's important. This information that's, that, that, that's in this film that I'm still making, it's a work in progress, right? Um, it's something that most Americans don't know anything about. They've never heard this. How do you think Mexican-Americans feel? 
Um, now the story gets a little worse, okay? I just want to prepare you. Um, after I leave here today, um, I'm actually going out to West Texas, not far from Marfa, which is out in the desert, way out there. And I'm actually going out there because um, I'm scouting um, what is, I guess you could call it, a, an unmarked mass grave. Okay? Um, in 1918, really in the midst of all of this racial violence that, against Mexican Americans that was taking place, um, there was one incident that was sort of stands out for its egregiousness. Um, there was a small little village near the, near, in Texas near the Mexico border called Puerto Venier. And there had been a robbery a month earlier, about 40 miles away, and some law enforcement folks got a tip that maybe in that village there might be someone associated with that robbery. And during the robbery, the, the shop owner got shot and was killed. Terrible thing. And so the Texas Rangers and the US Cavalry came into Puerto Venir in the middle of the night, and they ended up rounding up the entire male population of the town, which was all Mexican and Mexican-American. And they took them to the edge of the desert, and they killed them all, executed them. Arms blown off, heads, the whole thing. It was really bad. And then they left. And the next day, the women and the kids went out to find you know, what had happened, and they found the bodies. And they loaded them onto a cart. And they went just across the river, which was no more than you know, a couple of blocks away, city blocks away. And they dug a mass grave, and they put all the bodies in there. And then they fled to parts unknown. They were too scared to return to their homes. And good thing they didn't, because the soldiers and the Texas Rangers came back and they burned the whole place down. Now, because of this period of violence in American history, Mexican Americans across the country were traumatized, really scared. And they did something very interesting, actually. They began to organize, and they founded an organization not far from where we are today, down in Corpus Christi, called LULAC, the League of United Latin American Citizens. And they founded this place called LULAC. And what they ended up doing is they ended up creating a program called Little Schools 400, which we know today as Head Start. And they started to sue. They brought more than 81 civil uh, voting rights lawsuits, and they won every one. And then what they did is they sued in the courts over segregation. And they ended up doing, in 1947, a case Westminster versus, well, Mendez versus Westminster. And they desegregated public schools in California. And they worked with a young attorney, an African-American dude, who came out there to work with them on the case. And that guy took all of those legal precedents that Mexican-Americans had been doing across the country and the strategies and that architecture. And when he had a chance, he went before the Supreme Court and argued a case called Brown v. Board of Ed. His name was Thorogood Marshall. Mexican Americans worked with that guy. We worked together. And it made this nation a better place. It transformed the lives of millions. When I was growing up in Seattle with those kids who called me Spick, I wish we had known that story. Because I don't want to see other kids called that. I don't want to see. Black kids called that? I don't want to see Muslim kids called that. Or Native American kids or transgender kids. I've been there. I've been a spick. I know what that is. And I don't want white kids called that either. Most of the young people in the state of Texas today, under 18, are Latino. Most of the young people in California today are Latino. 
And by the time they reach middle age, by 2050, we will, we will be a majority minority country. And soon to follow, we will be a Latino country. Now we can go kicking and screaming, and we can become the United States of anxiety, the United States of acrimony, the United States of suspicion, or we can figure out how to find our common humanity, how to span divides of difference, and find new connections for positive change and understanding in an America that welcomes all of us. And I guess that's why I'm here today. Because I think what you do is so vitally important. You can tip the balance. Because when we have an understanding of who we are, the horror and the beauty, we can understand our common story and how complex it is. In my opinion, historical preservation is not really about buildings or places or things. What it really is, it's about the stories that those buildings and places and things represent because they tell us what it is to lead a life well lived and what it is to lead a life squandered. They tell us what stories are worthy of remembrance and what stories shall be forgotten and turned to dust. And so I feel like you and I, we do the same thing. We're in the story biz, right? And so much depends upon us. And that's why I love that tagline. Where is it? It's not at. Past forward. By understanding and reconciling the past, we can find a beautiful road forward. But we have to be honest and truthful about it. And that's why that other name is so important to me, the National Trust. That's, that, that's heavy. So can we do it? Well, as my friend Dolores Huerta once told me, si se puede, yes we can. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage our session moderator, Max Page, and our Trust Live responders, Afifa Saeed, Manuelito Wheeler, and Teresa Leger de Fernandez. Thank you. Oh my God, that was beautiful. Well, thank you, John. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I almost want to just say, <laughs> let's end and let's think about what John just said. But we also have several remarkable um, activists in Heritage here with us. So I think we, hopefully we can, we can have a really good conversation about this. But I really want to especially thank you, John, for reminding us what we all should know, but don't always, and it's a sobering reminder that this country and its history is bathed in blood and violence. And I think it's worth, it, it's required to remind us of this, and, and I really appreciate that you did that today with your presentation. So this, this is called Trust Live Voices. And so we can understand that word in a couple ways. One is as bringing back the voices from the past, giving them their respect and due, but also making sure that the diverse voices of America are amplified today. So I guess I'm wondering, when I look at that amazing clip you had, like what, what do you hope the effect will be on your, on your viewers? Hmm. Well, I, look, the kids I grew up with uh, who called me Spick, they were good kids. I mean, they were good people. They really were. And you know what it was, I, I think, in retrospect, is uh, our parents and the adults had let us down. Because they didn't, they didn't tell the full story. 
They didn't, they, did, they, they didn't include everything that happened. They didn't give us the darkness of the past, nor did they give us the light and the beauty that evolved out of that malignancy that would forge a better nation. They never gave that to us, and so we just, I, you know, we didn't know any better. And so it's up to the adults to make sure that that doesn't happen. And know? it seems like places, even though you say this is about stories, at the very end you, I think, made that connection that it's stories that take place, that stories are, live in places. They right. It, well, it's not the building, it's not right. the brick and the mortar, it's not the, 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 the trees and the undulation of the land. Right? What makes Gettysburg Gettysburg is not that it's a plot of land, it's the story of what transpired there once upon a time. You know, what, uh, you know, what makes a building important is, 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 the, is, is the humanity that passed through there and the stories that evolved. And what that tells us about the human spirit, what that tells us about human dignity, what that tells us about what we once were, and the promise of what we might become. Yeah. So what you raise is such a central issue that I think we're dealing with in the fields of, of heritage and historic preservation is the relationship between the objects, the places, the physical places, and the stories and the memories that go with them. And we have these three amazing people. So I, I kind of want to pose that question to each of you all. We can have a discussion about it. Uh, maybe we'll start with Manny. Um, each of you acts, interacts with places in a different way. We have lawyers, and cultural anthropologists, and specialists in, in recovering and preserving language. What roles, what role or roles do old places play in the work you do in kind of recovering and amplifying voices of diverse America? Do you have a thought, Manny? Um, I think, you know, I want to uh, start out by saying that this entire country, even the land we're sitting on, was um, bulldozed over and built on stories of the original inhabitants of this country. And that's the uh, American Indian people. So, you know, there's a lot of discussion about uh, the preservation of stories and what can happen when there is a blatant forgetting of the stories. And that is what happened with this country. Like right now on this, this land, it's like we don't know what the stories were. There were people here that had deep um, connection to the land, and those stories are gone, and they're, they're gone forever, or they're either uh, a, a shell of the story. And, you know, that um, turning away from the story, the truth, is what was portrayed in the documentary we just saw. And I think as a country of American people, we are now becoming um, mature enough to start dealing with the story. And that includes my people's story. And it's a funny thing when you try to just like brush over, forget about the, the story, but eventually you have to deal with it. In order for our children to be able to have the future that we talked about, a future of hope, we're gonna have to deal with my people's story, your people's story, your people's story, everybody that is now what makes up America. So I think a very wise person once said, the truth will set you free. <laughs> Thank you, man. Teresa, do you have? So I think that um, in my work, I think I'm here kind of maybe with two different perspectives. I'm a Chicana who happens to work representing Native American tribes and as the vice chair of the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. So there's all these different little hats we wear. And part of that, I think, is the strength of what stories do, is that when they are the most powerful, there are different audiences for them, mm -hmm. right? There's the audience of the people who created that story, because that is who they are, and that leads to their existence and to their self-affirmation and to their celebration. 
And then there are those who are not part of that story, but are fascinated by it and are willing to change perspectives because of it. And it's that ability to have people change perspectives because they listen to a story. And that, I think, is why it is important to when we have the hanging tree, we don't just say, well, here's a hanging tree, because we're fascinated with death and violence, but rather that you layer on top of that the story of what did that mean, because then maybe you change perspective. Mm -hmm. I actually didn't think I wanted to talk about it, but the North Apple, right? The Dakota Access Pipeline. What has happened there? I have, one of the probably biggest things that ever happened <laughs> for the National Historic Preservation Act, because you actually have Section 106 talked about on NPR. Mm -hmm. I mean, when does that happen? But <laughs> right? And I was like, I'm, it's like, oh my God, I'm associated with that, right? Yay! And we did the right thing, right? We did the right thing. We talked, we said, no, you need to have a brighter, broader perspective. No, Army Corps, you need to look at the entire impact of this. So that was the right thing we did as a federal agency. But the more powerful thing I think that's come out of it is this idea that it's captured the collective voices of people who are not Native American. And they're streaming up there. And they're saying, we've heard this story, and we think we need to change what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And those sacred lands don't mean anything to the Anglos who are going up, the Native Americans who are, I mean, the other, other tribes, a lot of my clients are headed up there. Um, Latinos, Chicanos are headed up there, environmentalists are headed up there, because we, it captured the imagination and said, we need to change what we're doing. And it is that ability that a story can galvanize collective action. Because in the end, it's only when we work together, it's only when Dolores Huerta says, si se puede, she is talking about the union, the farm workers' union, which nobody really cared about. What happens with the farm workers? But then all of a sudden, we're boycotting grapes, and we're not eating grapes, and that caught the collective action, and people said, no, I get it. And what she said is, they said, oh, we can't do that. And her response was, si se puede. And Obama apparently did ask her if he could use it. <laughs> if he could use it. But it's that idea that we have to be able to work collectively and communally. Right. And so the place galvanizes, I agree with you, but then it's how we all work together around that. Whether we are the same, whether it's our story or not, whether we can understand each other. This is such, a, such an important point that you bring up, that because the expanding who's included in the American story and what places we preserve cannot, could potentially be fracturing. But the way you're talking about it and the way you do, John, in your, in your presentation and film is about how places, but telling the stories that have been not told and been covered over actually is for all of the people in this country, not just for that particular group. It has to be for both. And someone, an expert in identity, Afifa, what you, you talked about your, your experience in this. Yes. Um, I'm just, I mean, I'm listening to your story, and it's the reflection of your story and my story. And I think that's the important thing about storytelling, too, is that that's, I see myself in that story in so many different ways. And as somebody working on identity, the idea that we are creating identity and that identity is not something static. And for a long time, and I don't know if I'll ever get um, invited back here again, but I was an anti-preservationist. Because in my mind, as a cultural anthropologist, sometimes it meant, and I was, a, I was a, you know, an applied anthropologist, so I'm always looking at problem solving in that sense. So I was always concerned that we have this thing that we have to preserve something in some sort of pristine manner, and it has to be something that's just right, and it's just, you know, that, that culture is something that you have to preserve because it's something that doesn't change. So that frustrated me personally, because my, and this is the reason I got into cultural anthropology, was because I came to the US when I was five as in, in, with my parents as immigrant. My father decided we're not going to go back to, and I was born in Kashmir, north of India. He was a prisoner of conscience there with amnesty. He had been working on some of the um, issues of oppression. So he had decided we're not going to go back to India. So this is you know, the, the connections that we have, and we're going to be American. So we spoke American, we ate American, we were American in every possible way, except when I went to school, and you're not an American. You don't look like an American. 
Um, and that was frustrating as a, as a sense of identity for myself. But then um, many years later, we went to, to Kashmir to visit for the first time. And I'm thinking, all this time, I'm not an American. I have, I've been in America so long, but nobody accepts me as an American. I'm going to go to my homeland, and I will be accepted in my homeland. Because that's my people. As, at that point, I was thinking in my mind, as a teenager especially, I'm going to be anti-American, but I'll be finding my people when I go back to my country and so on. So I go to Kashmir, and I'm dressed as a Kashmiri, and I'm thinking I'm Kashmiri and so on. But I get up, and I walk across the room. And everyone says, there goes the American <laughs> walking across the room. Somehow, the way I walked was American. <laughs> and the way I carried myself. And so I was stuck in a situation where I was not feeling accepted. I was told I was not an American, but I go to my so-called homeland, which you know, everyone's telling everyone to go back home to wherever you're from. Going back there, I'm not accepted there either because I don't fit there. So I had to make the conscious decision about what does it mean to have an identity and to create an identity and, and be um, proactive in the elements that come to my, my identification as something. And so I think that's also a piece you know, that we talk about, which is formation of an American identity. What does that mean? And how, is, how are the pieces put into that? With my work, especially now, I'm, I'm looking at that formation piece. I'm looking at, especially as an American Muslim, what does that mean? What do the different pieces mean? And we're looking at lots of uh, modes of education, for example, in, in schools and, and so on. How do we how do we not just tell the stories, but embed those stories in curricula, embed those stories in the way that you, know, that you start looking at yourself and others as well? And I'll just, you know, one, one thing that we did that connects me to this idea of story and space was we had you know, some Muslim scholars and Muslim um, leaders, religious leaders, who were a little bit on the, um, I would say, on, you know, on the conservative side, but also on, on, a, on the side of, of saying, you know, they, they were, I'll just put it bluntly, they were Holocaust deniers, right? Didn't think it happened that much and so on and so forth. Took them and others on a trip to Auschwitz. And being in that space, being in that place, and understanding it just, not even saying anything, and just having that connection to it, coming back and understanding that I have something to connect with that space, I have something to connect with that story as an individual, and then coming back to, to, a, to a very different place and being able to preach about it and being able to connect to people about it and being able to use scripture, which is another big piece of this, how people are using religiosity and using their identity in religion, religious space mm -hmm. to understand our identities better. And so those, those connections were very important. And we recently, a couple of years ago, we took our students, um, their American Muslim students, talking about identity. And everyone's saying to them, you know, go back home, or, or you know, Muslims aren't really part of America. We took them to Mount Vernon, where, is, where George Washington is, is buried. So we get to lay the wreath on George Washington's grave. But then I also took them to the slave uh, graveyard, where the slaves are buried. And we had been talking about how many slaves came from Muslim countries, how many of them practiced and tried to practice their religion, and were suppressed and oppressed in their practice of religion, and yet continued to feel that connection. And so we made a prayer over the, the, the uh, unmarked graves of slaves, and the students felt the connection between history, between identity, and between religion across the board. And so when they come back and someone tells them, you know, Muslims aren't, don't belong in the US, they can say, no, actually, we've been here a long time. And the connection is not just religiosity, but it's part of what made America the same story, that we're a part of this for many generations. And it wouldn't, have, wouldn't be what it is, and so on and so forth, without those connections. So I think that's what I'm interested in, is how, how do we continue to make these connections on a personal level and also institutionally? I'm so impressed by the way you all move so easily between what we call tangible and intangible heritage. Often it's treated as if there is a big divide. And in some ways, there is within these fields. But you all just move back and forth easily around this idea of story. And, and identity, and I think that's really impressive. Now look, I, I feel like we have to put on the table, um, since you all um, come from such a range of places, ethnicities, races, we have to put on the table what happened this past, this past year. I look, at, I look at this, I look what's on the, on, the, on the stage here, and each of the groups represented here, I know I'm the white guy, but I'm also Jewish, and so there was a lot of awful things that came out in this, in this past year's campaign. A lot of hate speech. Now there's hate crimes that have 
that are, ex that are exploding, a lot of attacks on the very people that the movements for an inclusive um, preservation movement, uh, the groups that, the, the, that the, an inclusive preservation movement is trying to involve. How has the kind of, really the, the unprecedented, or at least in the last generation, the unprecedented kind of a discrimination and racist statements and bigotry, how does that change your work, or how might it change your work? as a filmmaker, as a cultural anthropologist, as a lawyer, I mean, how, how are you gonna react? Well, can I just throw sure. something out? Of because I, I, you know, all of that is very unfortunate. Um, but I, in, in, at least in my mind, there's a bigger fish to fry, which is global warming, you know? Uh, we're all in that box mm -hmm. together. And um, I don't know if, uh, how closely everybody follows the data, but um, we're in trouble. And that goes beyond, you know, some dumb kid being called a spick, okay? I mean, this is like, uh, this is, uh, I mean, we, we're teetering on a global catastrophe. So that could be a unifying force. You're I don't know what maybe, it's going to be, but I'm just saying that, 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 that at least as far as I can tell, the stakes are really high because of that. Mm -hmm. and, and that we're not, as a society, uh, talking about that a lot more um, is uh, very, very, very uh, disconcerting to me, probably more than everything else combined, in my mind, from my perspective. Mm -hmm. so, others have a thought? Yeah. So that Lisa. gets to, there's actually a uh, really good author named Naomi Klein um, and, and her book, uh, but it goes back to the idea of this collective, of act, a acting as community and collectively, and she actually posits that one of the reasons it's difficult to adjust global warming is precisely because there is such an insistence that we don't act collectively, we don't uh, act communally and coordinating. And I'm gonna, I am gonna bring that back to historic preservation and what we do here because one of the things that strikes me is that what we're supposed to do, right, the only really weapon and tool we have is this idea of communication this idea of consultation, mm -hmm. which actually forces us to talk to each other and to try to understand each other. And that that is a very, you know, when you first looked at it, when I took my first 106 case, which was trying to preserve some sites along the Grand Canyon from an FAA that had no idea that you actually had to talk to tribes. <laughs> you know, it was like, yeah, you do. And it's like, all we really have is the, the power of talking to you. All we really have is the power of consultation. But when you can have that power of consultation, mm -hmm. you actually can start changing people's minds. That FAA guy who didn't think he had to talk to tribes, he became our hero in the agency. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, so I'm, I mean, I, I think that that is important and that's what needs to happen as we move forward. I mean, the issues of trying to say, we want to have a more inclusive, uh, I mean, that's what the uh, ACHP is. We want to have a more inclusive preservation program. I don't think that's going to stop only because it's not coming from the ACHP. It's not coming from the trust. Mm -hmm. It's coming from those communities. And they're rolling. And they are talking among themselves. And they are getting active. And so I don't think that's going to stop. But I think it needs to just, it just has to have, we just have to stay say it's going to keep moving, there's going to be some new energy in it, These, the, the millenniums, my children, the way they're talking about what they want to do, and they're going to just keep going. I think that's that momentum that has started, that inertia has started, it is not going to stop because of this. It's going to be difficult because it's hard to come back from, um, you know, being, my, my community is fractured. My community is scared. Right. And in New Mexico, what we always say is, we didn't migrate. The border switched on us. You know, it's like we were here and then the border went there. And so it's really a perspective, but we are, we are surrounded by immigrants. We work with them and they're scared, right. you know. But I think it's those of us who have the ability to have voice and have the ability to speak out and have the ability to organize that we just have to right. sort of re 
commit ourselves and have that perseverance. You know, it's the next generation that's going to have the energy, and it's my generation that has to have a little bit of wisdom, but also the idea of perseverance. It's not done yet, right? It's still going. It's interesting. Those, those who attended the plenary session on, uh, a couple of nights ago were treated to a real demographic sort of overview of Houston. And essentially, um, Stephen Kleinberg said, this is America, no matter what no matter what policies, this is the direction. It's going to look more like this than, um, than um, it, it looks right now, uh, much whiter. So there's, there's, there's things changing that, are, that go far beyond any particular election. Manny, I don't know if you have a thought from your perspective and in, in your, in your work in, in, in cultural preservation. Um, <laughs> so uh, I think the word um, that was just said was survivor. And so, you know, we're all survivors one way or another. American Indian people have been, uh, there's been attempted genocide on an entire race of people that was sanctioned by the United States government. So I think that's something that is uh, very uh, important to pay attention to. And, um, t but as a point of hope, I mean, that's what we have lived through, and I'm here because of my ancestors' strength and their ability to survive. And that's what we all need to strive for. You know, we need to strive to be survivors and to mold this country's uh, future for something that is just and fair, what, whatever and however that's defined. I guess that's the trick question is, one person might define justice and fairness much differently than another person. But, you know, um, my people have lived through much worse conditions. Many of um, the people here in this audience, their ancestors have gone through those types of circumstances. So, you know, let's not run to the hills. You know, let's kind of stick together and survive. So it's Oddly, the history, the long history of blood and violence and even genocide in this country is oddly uh, comforting, I guess, in terms of looking at the long span of time and a con continued survival and, and resistance among, among many people who have been oppressed. Leif, I have to ask you as well. We have groups that have been here that, are, that had long histories in the US of this of kind of um, violence and oppression. And at the moment, there's a new focus on Muslim Americans. I wonder, I know you work with a lot of different groups, but tell me from your perspective what this current moment looks like in terms of how we build a common identity out of a very fractured American identity right now. Yeah, so I don't want to fall into the trap of representing all of course. Muslim Americans. From your perspective. A lot of times you get into those spaces. Um, and the fact that even within any community, whether it's Muslim Americans, or we have communities Right? So whether it's a group of religious folk, within that you're going to have so many different representations and expressions, which is really critical for this conversation on identity and so on. So that, that was, goes back to my concern about preservation. You know, so let's right. make sure that the Muslim uh, community gets this, this, and this. Well, what are we talking about within that? And, and want to make sure that we have that representation uh, amplified. So that's, that's partly. But I think what, we're th what I'm thinking through personally, and then I, I just came from the American Academy of Religion, uh, we had the meeting in San Antonio, it came from that yesterday, and talking about the role that everybody has to play. And it's not, and I, I want, in my mind, it's very clear to me, it's not just in reaction to an election. It's not just in reaction to a political stance and so on and so forth. It really is what we should be doing, and, and the fact of the matter is what many of us have been doing, which is also a critical part of the story, which is building these alliances. So the Jewish Muslim Alliance, for example, has had its, you know, um, it has had its moments of really clarity where you say, you know what, we are really, we have an experience together. I mean, and we were talking about how many Pakistanis and, and Muslims are working on some of the Native American um, advancement issues and, and so on and so forth. So amplifying those, that we actually do have alliances that we've been building. We do have connections. 
And it's not just because we have a negative experience of being an Am Americans that are oppressed or, and so on, but it's a positive experience of we are creating this identity. And I want to, you know, I go back to the identity issue because I think that's also unifying for us in terms of a way that we can come together and say, yeah, I am an American Muslim and this is what that means. And it also means for you as a Jewish American, but also you as a Native American and, and so on and so forth. Um, so I think part of the is the alliance building. The other thing we talked about at this meeting yesterday was also there will be some folks whose uh, job will be to be um, bridge builders. And so that goes to alliances also, but it's also more proactive. And you go out and you're going to say, I'm going to be in uncomfortable situations, and I'm going mm -hmm. to put myself in, in conversations I don't really want to be in, but I have to be in, further some of this identity and, and connectivity. Um, and then we also have sanctuaries. People, we need to create spaces, and I, and I think this is, um, this speaks to the preservation folks, where some of the work that you're doing in preservation can become those platforms where people can come and talk about identity, where it can be a space to say, what is not my identity? as much as what is. And that's, that makes sense because that's a place, or, a, or a, a, I mean, it's a place, but it's also a space for storytelling and so on and so forth. And that's a sanctuary where people can come and feel, feel safe to talk about it. Um, and my concern is also to include voices that we are not used to talking to, again, because there are people, I mean, I have, I have people that I know in, um, in the Muslim community, and again, you know, because we homogenize, that supported the, the president-elect. And they supported the president-elect as Muslims because they said he's going to um, protect us from ISIS. And that's my main concern as an American, mm -hmm. as a Muslim. Mm -hmm. And that's, for some people that was difficult to hear because of all the other rhetoric that is mm -hmm. anti-Muslim. But there you go. And there you are in terms of how complex this issue is. Right but how much more we have to make those connections right. and create those safe spaces for people that don't agree with us, right. even more than we have been. But I don't want to think that we've never done anything and now suddenly we have to start doing all sorts of things. But the last thing I wanted to say that I'm, I'm really interested in doing is creating spaces, again, inside communities. So within the Muslim community, for example, we are starting to talk mo much more than we ever have about racism within the Muslim community. Mm. And what does that look like? Um, and other kinds of isms that are in our country overall, but then how do we address them from within these communities? And those are difficult conversations, but they are also necessary for us to move forward to heal and then to do the bridge building outside of communities. Thank you. So we only have a couple minutes left, and um, in preparing for this conversation, one amazing project that Manny's involved with came up, and I, I don't want to project a false optimism, um, although I have to say, this conversation gives me the first like glimmers of optimism I've had in 10, 11 days, so I really appreciate that. Um, but Manny, maybe you could just very briefly introduce the film you are working on, and then we're gonna show a very, a very brief clip to end, because I think it really does kind of, it's an uplifting project. Okay, um, I worked on a project that involves a movie you may have heard of, called Star Wars, so uh, um, there are many, uh, the Navajo Nation is the largest Indian tribe, and we have over 300,000 members. Of that, about half speak Navajo, and of that half that speak Navajo, I would say 80% of them are over 40 years old. So, you know, we're trying to bring awareness about um, language preservation. And so um, I reached out to Lucasfilm and asked them if we could uh, make their movie um, and dub it in, in the Navajo language in an effort to help um, our young people and you know, whoever wants to watch it uh, become introduced um, and want to learn Navajo. But something on the side really interesting really happened, happened and it made uh, all of you, it forces you to rethink what you think Indian people are. And it also, for our own people, it forced us to rethink like who and what uh, we are. Mm. So, right. so we can clip. show it now. Yes, I think it's great, you know, because for one thing, it was really really hard to translate because there's some words in there that you can't really translate and to make it short like that like these guys did uh, it's amazing
Edo Marvin, because that's Andre Delia. Because that's Okay, let's just use because that's not. Because that's not. Oh, a lot of the terms that are used in the movie, they've been invented. Some things didn't have concepts for them, like uh, the force, which I think is a, a great term. It's ahoniye, it's kind of like awe-inspiring, fear-causing. And I was telling the translators, my favorite one was which basically um, describes like planet fragments falling like rain. And it's very visual, Navajo is a very visual language, and they, they use that. And in some instances, long Navajo names can get really long, and they've done a great way of making them shorter, like Beshtin for lightsaber. And just seeing how different translators came together to translate this movie, it was great to see the advancement of the language through a movie like this, and seeing that if we continue to use it, it won't die, and Navajo can be fluent enough to incorporate new concepts and to come up with new words for things. It's a honey I feel very proud that it's happened and that it's done. I think that we've opened the door to something bigger than we ever imagined. Fantastic. Mm. Well, Thank you all. Let's just join me in thanking these incredible preservation activists. Yeah.